I am a Boeing. Um, as we talk strategy, concretely, you won the Nobel Peace Prize, now with the president of Liberia, President uh, S Johnson Sirleaf, um, for bringing peace to Liberia in the midst of a civil war. Can you talk about the actual strategies you used from the protests outside to the sex strikes inside? Um, <laughs> and then take us from there uh, to the trial of the man you took on, the president of your country, and finally to what you've been dealing with today, Ebola in Liberia. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we've never really gone into is the beginning of the movement. And most times I tell people we didn't wake up one morning and decided that we were going to protest. It was two years of hard work. Bringing women together under a common banner takes a lot of thinking and strategizing. And I think the first thing we had to do um, was to deal with the issues of trauma that the women had gone through. Um, I have a theory that I usually say when we go through all of the mess that we go through as women, we're like um, sponges soaking up all of the dirt around us. And usually we, especially for us, uh, my experience as an African girl, we've never really been socialized. I call myself a girl because I feel real beautiful this morning. <laughs> My kids would be embarrassed if they were here. <laughs> but we, we've never really been socialized to, to, to just tell our pains. So a lot of the women we begin working with had gone through different kinds of experiences, including myself. And for us to be able, one of my first experiences working with a group of women was that we could not move past the personal to get to the political. And that has really brought me to the conclusion that in whatever work we do, the personal is political, regardless of how people see it specifically as it relates to women's involvement, all of these different things. So we had to deal with that first. The second thing we realized that we had to do was to do a lot of re-socialization. We, we were socialized to believe that politics was a man's thing, um, getting in the public space. Was, so that whole re-socializing or bringing those women to, to, to start to rethink their role in the society was the second thing we had to do, bring them into training rooms and bring them into spaces. We, we had to ask women, I, I, I'll just, this is a very safe space, write down something as a woman in your community that you've always wished you had to do. One of my vivid experiences is that going to one of the trainings and these women wrote down, there was a Muslim woman who said she just wanted to experience wearing a dress, a hat, and a pair of shoes with makeup. We made that possible for her. We used to do all kinds of things. One group said they had never been into a nightclub. As trivia as these things may sound, those were the things that we needed to take women through to be able to bring them to that place where there was an understanding that I am a person. I have all of these things around me that I've never really experienced. I've never really felt them. I haven't touched them. Just being in a room and being able to do so, we, we, we had to raise money to get women on airplanes. Mm. Took them to places, women from rural villages, and they came back and say, I can die in peace, I can do whatever, because mm. now I see the possibility of just being a woman. Once we were able to move past that, we, we, we had to work with Christian and Muslim women. We had to begin to reconceptualize religious spaces. So today you, you see all of these issues of fundamentalism arising in the world. Um, it's not that we didn't have those um, ideas and myths and misconceptions about the way people saw um, religion and religious spaces, but we had to go back into those books, the Quran and the Bible, and really bring women to understand that this is what it says about this and this is what it says and what is your role. And then finally, we had to find a common agenda. People believe that building movement, you can just wake up in the morning, blow a whistle, and tell women, come together. No. <laughs> Until they feel that this is something that is touching each and every one of us in different ways, and that thing has to be a common thread, they will not mobilize. Mm -hmm. And once we form that common agenda, we were able to move on. We build peace, but again, 
people sometimes, you, you talk about Rosa Parks sitting in, and I just read a very beautiful article about the Nigerian women riot in the 1927. And it said, the women of Abba during the riot did a sit in. And people do not understand when women sit in, according to the writer, those women said they were sitting in to invade the male spaces. So it wasn't, they, they, they were never allowed to go to the courts unaccompanied by their husbands. They were never allowed to stand in the presence of the governors. But when they went and sat in those spaces, it was like the public space socially is for the men. We are in this space, we're invading your space. So when we did the protest, we invaded the spaces of men. We got peace. Obviously, the normal reaction to a lot of peace movement is that, okay, now you have peace, go back home, have more babies, sing kumbaya, let your husbands be the politician, and at the end of the day, it's okay. We went to all of the, 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 the international bodies and said to them, this peace agreement is, 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 is a very beautiful document, but what it has done to women is to, to because it's almost 300 pages, you're telling the women you can't read this. Is there a way for you to simplify this? And they said, no. So we took it upon ourselves, took the peace agreement back home and simplify it and set benchmarks. And then we gather the women back to say to them, if you don't see this happening in your community at this time, protest. Mm. So the protest continued for two and a half years, even after we gained peace in 2003. And then it was time for elections. Liberia had been independent from 1847. Women properties, property owner were only allowed to vote in 1957. So 110 years after independence before women property owner. Think about Africa, how many women owned property in 1957 to be able to vote. So technically it was just saying a lot of you will not vote. It was not until the 1980s that ordinary women were able to cast their votes. Mm. So when we started hearing elections were coming, we needed to go back again and reinvent or invent a role for women in the political sphere. So we had to do from door to door campaign to everything. By the time we ended, I tell people, we had registered 50 plus one more women in Liberia than men. It's not rocket science that President Sirleaf won the elections. We were present, you know. How, did, so, you, how did you take Charles Taylor down? Well, I think, I think one of the, the, the things that people tend to, to do when it comes to movement, I, I would say we were very blessed that Liberia and Liberians, even the fighters had come to a place where war fatigue was a major uh, um, um, advantage that we had. So then when we started protesting, you know how Gandhi said first they laugh at you, mm -hmm. then they ignore you, then all of those different things, when we started, I understand because one of Taylor's closest allies was one of the persons who was funding us. The woman who, he, who was his advisor in the morning and the one who he spoke to at night was the person giving us our biggest funding every day when we started protesting. <laughs> and I, she would use these different cell phone lines to call me and say, you can't stop, this boy has lost it and it's up to the women to do this. You have to do whatever you can do. And once our, we started protesting, she said one day he asked that little girl, is she married? And he said, no, because at the time there was no man. I didn't have time or even to, <clears throat> <sighs> <laughs> So, yes. And I said, she said, no, she's not. And he said, well, maybe she likes me. And you know, so later on she told me that story and I laughed and I said, not in my wildest dream. <laughs> anyway, they, they took us for granted. And I think what Taylor could not phantom was I have a military state. Who are these pathetic looking women to challenge me? And usually this is what happens to detectors and men and boys and people generally who thrive on violence, they have no response for nonviolence. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you totally, you, you make them totally inefficient and ineffective. When they come at you with violence and you respond with nonviolence, you demobilize them. And that's what we did to Taylor. So persistently sitting out there, they were always waiting for us to make the wrong move. 
and we're always, because the wrong move was, okay, they would throw stones, they would be violent, and every time we responded with nonviolence. At the end of the day, the one thing was also persistence. We were persistent, we were present, and, and, and sometimes I tell, I was talking to my sisters from South Sudan a few months back, and I said to them, we, we, we had invitations at the time to travel and share our stories, but we refused to leave Liberia because that was what was important. And I think this is where we miss it in the movement. As soon as our movement starts gaining traction and everyone is sending us invitations, we get too distracted and we want to travel and explain. Peace will never come to your space unless you decide I'm going to leave everything and focus on this, and that's what we had. We had a very focused agenda. Very briefly, could you explain what a sex strike is? <laughs> you know, desperation can do a lot of things, and we're really desperate for peace. And because I was the, the one who wasn't married at the time in the group, a lot of people thought that I was the one who initiated the idea of a sex strike. It was a Muslim woman. She said, let's deny our husband's sex. And once she said that, the media picked it on when we made it public. Eventually, we knew that because the world would only pay attention to anything sexy, that became the major media strategy for us. And I've realized that women in other parts of the world over recent times who've used this have really gotten what they want because the world still can get it. It has to be about sex and women. In Togo, when the women decided sex strike, my phone almost burned from ringing that day. But these women had been agitating in Togo for months about a change in the electoral law. Once they said sex strike, the international community started paying attention and they got the change in the law. <laughs> so it is a very good media strategy, but you have to know how to do it. The women in the rural areas took it very seriously. They linked it to religion. They linked it to their prayer life. And their husbands who were really suffering as the result of the war decided to go along with them. You asked a final question and asked the question about Ebola. And I will talk about that briefly. I think when the Ebola struck in March of last year, we had a public health crisis and we had three governments, and I will not speak just about Liberia, that were very unresponsive to the needs of the ordinary people. Ebola is a poor man's disease. It, 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 it thrives in, in, in slum communities and in poverty-stricken areas and in areas that are more where you have people congested, that's where the disease will, will easily spread. Nobody paid attention. In our country, June, I was back home and I was supposed to lead a youth camp. We had prepared for, done all of the logistics. Children were ready to be taken from every part of Liberia to go to youth camp. And then my staff people said to me, let's talk to the government. You have people in the Ministry of Health. I went to my key friends and said, can I host my camp? How many children? 50, no. This is June when no one was paying attention, he said, please don't quote me. This thing is bad. People are dying, but we have to keep it quiet. So both Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, for political reasons, for economic reasons, were keeping the death of their citizens very quiet. Not only were they unresponsive to the needs, they had no plan. Not only did they have plan, but the people have, the people's lack of trust in their governments made the disease to thrive. In Liberia, when the disease started, people were saying, this is our government way of shaking down the international community for more money. <laughs> so it, it, it became a serious problem. And then when the government decided to respond, it took a political dynamic. I remember one day, the Ministry of Health calling me and saying, you know what, you're a public figure. Communities listen to you, want to do a PSA, and we want to use your voice. And I said, sure. I sat in my office all day, no one came. Mm -hmm. So that evening, I said, well, someone has given us an idea. Let me go and do a PSA. So I went to the radio station, did a public service announcement, and they put it out there. 
Later on, someone called me and said, do you think the government was ever going to use your voice for a PSA on Ebola? You have to think twice. It was going to make you look good. And we don't want to make you look good. So there was already divisions and a divide. You, usually countries will have um, disaster, natural disaster or public health crisis and it will bring everyone on board. The response to the crisis in Liberia has been as divisive as the country is. If you're not part of the status quo, you don't work on this end. And so we, we, we've had that crisis. The global role in the U.S., the Republicans milked it at their advantage. They used the ignorance of people who would not just stop and read to talk about how Ebola would come and capture everyone and kill them. You get in a text and they say, your accent sounds funny. Do you have Ebola? And some days you are looking at brothers and sisters from countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, and sometimes, with all due respect to people, I will be tempted to say, do you have a gun? But it was just as bad as it was. You have places like Long Island, where they were washing playgrounds of children because Ebola was in the air. My child that had never been to Liberia for almost two years, going to university in the U.S., was taken off a line, put into a separate cart, and shuttled into a room to be interrogated by some women on when she had, last she had been to Liberia. The ignorance that people put out there, especially nations that should understand some of these implications, really exacerbated the problems that we had. But you cannot say or blame it on these nations because our governments were irresponsible. A few weeks ago, I sat on a BBC debate with the Guinean Minister of um, International Trade and Cooperation, Minister Sano, and he said, well, you know, the three countries had come out of war. We have problems, our health structure is down, and all of these things. And as he was talking, I was just sitting there looking at this man, making a fool of himself and thinking he was making a fool of the world. My one question to him was, Minister Sano, even though these countries have come out of war, but they've never ever stopped the government officials from these countries from buying $500,000 cars each. This is where we find ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and very briefly, very briefly, how you took on Ebola, what it meant, the, what you felt was the solution that ultimately has led to What's the number now in Liberia? I think we, we're down to six days and counting, or five days and counting to being Ebola-free, mm. declaring Liberia Ebola-free. When the virus struck, I, I'm an activist, and usually when you have crisis, public health crisis and different crises, the first thing I think about is what is the role of the community. So by June, when everyone was saying that in private, this is a disease that is really devastating, I was saying to my team, let's raise money and give it to the communities. And the, the idea was that these people live in their communities, they understand their community structure, they know who and where all of these different things are coming from. They will help to debunk um, some of the myth of Ebola not being well, real. So we took money and started doing mini grants into communities. I'll give you an example quickly of one of the communities. The denier in that community of 20,000 or 50, between 50 and 20,000 people was so high that once we gave these women a grant, the women, again, they went on YouTube, downloaded the videos from DR, um, from Congo and other places where Ebola had been, and done a, it did a short documentary. Went back into their community where they had a small cinema, we call it video club back home, and paid for free entry for a week and asked the video club to show blockbuster movies. So one week, everyone is told in this community, you can go and watch a movie for free. It is jam-packed. Everyone is in there. Midway through the movie, they turn it off and they show the video on Ebola. That's how... The community came to recognizing. By the time we ended our mini grant scheme, we had granted funds, between, not million dollars, from 200 to 2,000 dollars to over 115 local NGOs and 26 local radio stations. At that same BBC debate, 
The head of the UN mission on Ebola said, we've recognized the value of engaging communities, so today we're funding community. I'm happy to be a trendsetter. <laughs> well done. Madeline, two things. One, if you could tell, well, as a journalist, a storyteller, I love the stories. Going back 100 years, how the women actually gathered together, how they actually came together from America, from Britain, how they were stopped in the middle of wartime, but still a thousand women gathered. And then your view of what a feminist foreign policy looks like. Thank you. Can I just make a couple of comments on what's been said? Because I think that if ever anyone queried the title of our conference, Women's Power to Stop War, listening to what Lema has just said, that's it. It's so important, the work that is done at grassroots, bringing it into challenging real power is fundamentally important and to do it in a non-violent way. It's exactly what the women who gathered together in 1915 wanted to do. Um, and answer that question, how amazing they did it. In the middle, of, I am still amazed that it could happen. Because when you think of it, how difficult is it to get people to The Hague today? We have lost several women from, well, 20 or 30 women from different countries who couldn't get visas. From DRC, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from other countries, they couldn't get visas to come to this conference, which is all about including women in stopping war. <laughs> We couldn't get Anuel Chowdhury, the one who introduced, the man who introduced Security Council Resolution 1325, he couldn't get a visa until it was way too late for him to be able to attend. And in those days, they tried to come from United States, United Kingdom, different other places, but mainly Europeans. The women, and they had to organize, they had to try and get documentation. The women from the United Kingdom, there were 180 who wanted to come. And surprise, surprise, they experienced the same things as our colleagues from the other parts of the world. Now they were refused documentation because there's a war on. And you can't go and talk about peace when we are busy <laughs> fighting a war. Um, and that's another thing about the, the whole issue of how is information being transferred. The media was obviously fueling propaganda for war. And the last thing you want is women going out there and doing propaganda for peace because that's not going to gel with your patriotic war. So they were stopped from coming. The women who organized and came from the United States, they got stopped in Dover for four days. Again, because at this stage there was, of course, the militarization of the channel, so you've got to try and get across there. Some women were able to get out and did the longer journey, so they went out through the Nordic countries and came to The Hague by a different route. But eventually, 1,300 plus women managed to come to The Hague. What had brought them together in the first place was a demand for the right to vote. So they were already organizing. It wasn't just, as you say, you suddenly blow a whistle and suddenly there's 1,300 women turn up in The Hague. No. They had been organizing together in their respective countries to demand the right to participate in the government structures of their countries. Um, with the view, one of the views was that, of course, that that would end wars. Um, and, of course, that was the argument that was used against them in the United States was because if women start participating in governance structures, they will have a say over war and peace, and they shouldn't have that responsibility. So the women, when they came, they, they came different ways, boats, not planes, obviously. They walked, they got to the, they got late to The Hague. Aleta Jacobs has been the, the magnificent suffragette, first medical doctor in Holland, who had helped to organize and brought a thousand women to help organize the entire event in the, in the Hague, ended up having to go to the zoo because it was the only space big enough. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. But then came to, together to then make the declarations that they made in 1915, and then to demand that there would be not just universal peace there, but that we would continue as an organization to identify root causes of conflict and then to do the various things that are, if you read downstairs, you will have the original declarations as to what it was they were demanding. And you'll see that those demands are as current now as they were then. So that's how they did it. I am still amazed that when we don't, there was no such thing, obviously, as being able to send text messages, telephone each other, it's all telegrams, it's pigeons, it's doves, it's go find but women did it, and that's all part 
of this entire movement, which continues today. And Aletta James, you just uh, dedicated a statue in the Peace Palace. Yes, yeah, she's the second woman to make it into the Peace Palace. I don't know how many male busts there are in there, but there's uh, there's one um, the beautiful bust that was was uh, unveiled earlier this uh, earlier this week on Sunday, um, and it's an honour that she should have had before, some would suggest, because as I say, the first doctor, the amazing suffragette woman who helped to create the Women's International League for Peace and continued her entire life, abandoned her medical practice to really work on issues of women's rights. So a real champion for all of us, I think. And the issue. We salute her. What a feminist foreign policy looks like. The other thing, before I go into foreign, foreign policy, because it's linked, it's absolutely linked to what Jody was saying and what Lema was saying about what happened in America in relation to the Ebola, it became militarized. The response in the United States was a militarized response. We take people, we lock them up, we're scared of you, so we other you. And so it becomes a danger to us, us Americans. And so instead of thinking how we should be engaging properly, doing the community outreach, doing that sort of work, we do a militarized type of response. And it's all about creating fear. And if you create fear often enough, then you need men with guns to protect you from that fear. And that's exactly the direction that the world is going, has gone. Um, and in reference to what Jody said, nothing about us without us. If you want a feminist foreign policy, then you have to know what it is that the women in the countries that you're going to be responsible for working with, what their analysis is. And it will be very different from the papers that will be put on your desk the minute you arrive in the foreign ministry, for sure. What is absolutely crucial and at essence of any foreign policy which is, is feminist, number one, the short version would be look at what everybody else does and then don't do it. So you put right up there, respect for and upholding of human rights. So if you're engaging with any country, you need to use the elements of your foreign policy. And let's just think, what are the elements of a foreign policy? It's not me, the foreign minister, wanting to do nice things for that country. It is me, the foreign minister, wanting to do nice things for that country with my country and my country's support and the multilateral system support. So the whole thing is an intricate network of different parts. So I can't just say my foreign policy, I have to look at my trading policy, my economic investment policy, my arms policy. I have to look at what the regional constellations are. So it's all of that, and I also have to take care of my domestic political constituency who enable me to be able to do that. So what you need to do first of all is look, again, back to human rights. What is the human rights situation in those countries within which you are? Deep, well, where you are going to be negotiating, working with. Who is in that community? Let us look at how well they're protected. Let's look at the legal frameworks. Let's look at, look at the discriminations, intersection of discriminations, whether the political economy is actually working to stop discrimination rather than fueling it. Is that actually, if that equality is not there, then you will see that that leads to instability, gender dynamics which are unequal, and increases the likelihood possibility of violence and then of violent conflict. Now, there is an international legal responsibility on the foreign ministers to do that assessment to see whether or not, as part of their foreign policy, they should be taking requisite action to ameliorate that, to make it better, to deal with it. And you're not going to be dealing with it well if you look at it, you analyze, and then you say, but do you have another shipment of arms as the United States does to Egypt, or as the world does to Saudi Arabia, save now for what Margaret Wallstrom said when she called them for being the medieval state that it is, that violates women's rights as it does. And yet still the world looks the other way. And when she said that, where were the other foreign ministers saying, actually, you're right, as a matter of international law, international obligation, we should be doing the same. We should be using our economic and our trade policies to put pressure on the Saudi government to change the way in which they respect their citizens. Madeline, for people who don't know um, who Margaret Wallstrom is and exactly what she did, if you could clarify. Yeah. Margaret Wallstrom used to be the special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Armed Conflict. Um, she's now the Foreign Minister of Sweden. 
Um, and she got into this mess because she denounced the flogging of a blogger. Um, and she said it was medieval. And she was due to speak at a meeting of the Arab League, and they barred her from coming in. So she said, well, barred her from speaking. Um, and so she said, okay, I am now cancelling the cooperation agreement we have on military with Saudi Arabia. Which doesn't mean to say we're going to stop selling you guns, but it does mean we're going to change the way we work with you because your record is not good enough. Which is exactly what international law says she must do. Um, but instead of everyone going, yes, Margaret, well done, some people in Sweden did, there was an outcry from those very trading partners that are needed to be included in your feminist foreign policy. H&M, Volvo, the others jumped the bandwagon and said, you're going to close the markets. The Arab markets will be closed to us. You cannot pursue this foreign policy. The arms industry, Sweden is the 13th, I think it is, sales person, sell, seller of arms in the world per capita. That makes you right up there. Um, that will damage our arms sales. The unions were therefore crossed because that might impinge on our jobs. And so she was in trouble. And of course it became gendered because she was emotional. She was a woman. So of course she should take time to reflect and think of the consequences of a foreign feminist foreign policy. Fortunately, she's stuck with the guns. But what I'm disappointed about is that no other foreign minister did the same. Mm. Not one of them. Mm. On the contrary, there was a huge fear amongst some parts of Swedish society that this attempt that Sweden was going to have to be on the Security Council, the fact that feminist foreign policy would lead them not obtaining this position on the Security Council. So because she wanted to prioritize human rights, because she wanted to prioritize using the power of trade in order to put pressure on the government to change, that was seen as a, a girly thing that doesn't belong in the Security Council, where you've all got to talk about conflict and arms trading and those sorts of issues, which are far more important. But if we had a feminist foreign policy, if we really had each of those states, each of the, the countries with a feminist foreign policy, which we then could input into, which we then shared information about, what a difference it would make. Would we really be spending all those trillions of dollars on arms instead of putting them into the Millennium Development Goals, and now the post-Millennium Development Goals, if all the foreign ministers could sit together and actually make that policy work. Jody, you come from the militarily most powerful country on earth, from the United States, and you take on <clears throat> the military-industrial complex. Under President Obama, there have been more military sales in the world uh, from the United States than any time in U.S. history, uh, and the, uh, the uh, the greatest amount, uh, the number one recipient of those sales is Saudi Arabia. But we're talking about countries. Some corporations have larger budgets than the budget of an entire country. Can you talk specifically how you take not only countries but corporations on? I don't care. Uh, I'm not a corporate, you know. Uh, static maker directly, but there are many tactics. There was a marvelous organization of women religious in the U.S. who would buy shares in, you know, of, of the company, and they would go to meetings of shareholders and stand up and denounce whatever issue it was that that company was engaged in, like General Electric, which brings good things to life in its old advertisements also gives us nuclear weapons. So they would go and put it in their face. We have the huge divestment movement now trying to get universities, for example, to divest from fossil fuels for climate change. Uh, we, we saw Harvard, which is the most gigantically endowed university in the United States, a week of protests at Harvard to get them to divest. There are those methods. There are also newly uh, conscious, if you will, corporations who recognize that perhaps being progressive on their own 
is a good thing. It will give good back to the community, but it will also increase their own sales. They're called grade B corporations. Um, I only learned of this on Facebook, one of my favorite news sources. It is not other places. But they have to go through a rigorous investigation to make sure that they really are giving back to the community, that they are not investing in weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, there are corporations who have social, what is it called? You know the ones that are social justice funds or whatever? Responsible. Yeah, that. Social. That. But they need to be investigated to make sure it's honest. Many of them are fake. You know, fake social justice or social involvement or, you know, doing a couple of things to look good, but in reality, they aren't. So it's all, it's all of taking it on that way. Also, it's some of our colleagues who go to arms bazaars and pretend at, when they first get to the big weapon sales places in the world, Paris, all over the US, China, they go in like they're looking to maybe buy something and they denounce and start, you know, and trying I'm, to educate. I'm taking on countries. The model that you used mm -hmm. with the international campaign to ban the landmine, mm -hmm. uh, while it was 20 years ago, what you specifically did, mm -hmm. how your organization mm -hmm. and you organized around the world. Well, it's not that different from what Lema said. You know, they don't happen overnight. We started out with two non-governmental organizations, one in the US, one in Germany, so we could call it the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, and it was a staff of one, moi. But we grew by reaching out to other organizations that logically had relations to the issue of landmines, you know, and, and slowly bringing them in, reaching out to all sectors of the globe where either the producer countries or the countries where landmines were on the ground and killing people, so that you had all of the voices involved. And then you look for a core group of countries that share the exact same goal, that really have been transformed in their thinking from being militaristic about all of their weapons to recognizing that these weapons kill for 100 years after the end of war, you have to give them up. So you have the core group of nations, and they are as pro-ban as you are, or pro, you know, saving the climate, or pro LGBTQA. It doesn't matter. You know, the model is the same for everything. And finally, as Lema also said, they expected us to cheer, declare victory, and go home the day the treaty was successfully negotiated in September of 97. Instead. We went to every delegation in that room and gave them our action plan for the next year as to what we were going to do to make sure they obeyed every word of the law they just created. And the treaty, though, <laughs> but like, like Lema said, you know, the hard work begins once you have the law. Hmm. You know, getting the law is not always easy, but beautiful words on paper are relevant. If you cannot make governments or the UN or whoever it is in power implement the beautiful words, it is completely irrelevant. And that's when you really have to dig in and, you know, push. Well, this is the opening plenary of this three days of a real brainstorm, a brain trust, uh, all of you gathering here and then going back to your countries. Edith, we began with you and we want to end with you. Um, bringing your 93 and a half years of wisdom um, to this gathering. Um, what you call on people here to do, what you're hoping to bring out of this to take home and continue your activism. Well, I certainly hope that we can, can come from here with a very strong determination to continue to work together, to keep in touch. You know, my own personal feeling is, 100 years, 100 years, women, not only the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, but many women and, and men in many different parts have worked against war, 
and for peace and for justice. I mean, for just a, a decent life for everyone, some equality. Mm -hmm. 100 years. And today, we're, it's, we're really worse off than ever. The challenges we have to face are so immense, really immense. So I let us really determine from here that we are going to work together. We don't have so much time. We no, I don't think we have another 100 years. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to bring about real changes. And you know what I miss? Maybe because I was born in a period where we were out on the street mm. all the time and, you know, we really, uh, we talked, we organized, we, we worked, uh, we got some laws by doing it. Uh, I miss this possibility that, that these mass <laughs> demonstrations, for example, we had in the 1980s even, have gone, we have become we, uh, I don't know what, because we are being attacked also. We, we, we are being attacked in many ways, trying to really change, make, bring some fundamental changes to our societies, to the world. And so we are being attacked and, and, and be, because the situation is getting so bad, poverty is getting se very severe, mm -hmm. people are suffering, people are dying. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, you know, when I was a refugee, we were helped. I mean, today, millions of people are being moved and displaced. Their countries destroyed. They really have no place to go back to even. Uh, I mean, it's so immense. I think we have to show our, hear our voices, make them much louder. And we have to be out in the street and defy really all that pressure that is on us, against us, to try and, you know, put us into little corners and categories and make it impossible. We have to really scream out together, all together. You know, <laughs> Democracy Now! is going to be broadcasting uh, from here at the World Forum every day. Uh, from 2 to 3, and I hope you tune in at democracynow.org. We're in the Central America room. You can check us out, bringing out a number of the voices that um, you hear today, and go home to your countries and tell people that there is a media, locally and globally, that is bringing out the voices of the grassroots. I think what you have heard today are the voices of the majority, because I really do think yes that those who are, who are deeply concerned about war and peace, who are deeply concerned about the growing inequality around the world between rich and poor, who are concerned about climate chaos, climate change, the fate of the planet, about racial justice and economic and social justice, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority. But the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take the media back as well. The, the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it is wielded as a weapon of war. Put the me back in media. Yes, the media is yours, and we need independent media to grow it all over the world. And when you strategize, always include a media component, how you get word out, because the silence must be broken. Which brings me back to where Edith came from. I mean, Edith was a refugee, a story in World War II of Hans and Sophie Scholl. I'm sure many of you know this story. They were brother and sister in Germany. They weren't Jewish, they were Christian. But they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? They, together with their professor and other workers, decided, let's get information out so the Germans will never be able to say we didn't know. And so they published a series of six pamphlets. And on one of those pamphlets, across the top were written the words, we will not be silent. They passed these out 
all over. They drop them in the middle of the night in a school yard, in a alleyway, in a marketplace, and they get these pamphlets out about what was happening. Hans and Sophie and their professor and others were caught by the Nazis. They were charged, tried, convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy Now! Right on.